Tell me again. I didn't feel oh, it or anything. Person need a hand a mother, their dead child, and say have a nice night. So can we do it? So hey, can we? Go! Go! On October 18th, 2018, Heather Gardner made a late night trip to a laundromat hoping to catch up on her chores for the week. With her was her sister Jessie, as well as Heather's two sons, her toddler Jathan and her two-month-old baby Benson. As the two women got to work with the laundry, Jessie made a shocking discovery. Benson was ice cold to the touch, and his lips had gone blue. Terrified, Heather began CPR while her sister made a harrowing phone call to 911. As Heather continues to follow the 911 operator's instructions, officers arrive on scene and are quick to take over. finally arrives, Benson is rushed inside for life-saving measures. Unfortunately, there's nothing they can do for him, and he's officially declared deceased. The immediate question was whether this was a case of something like SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, or if something far more unimaginable had occurred. Desperate for answers, Heather and Jesse tearfully explain to the officers what's going on. What exactly happened? We just picked him we up, just picked him up from the babysitter. I took him out of there and he was cold. Despite the horror and trauma that Heather's going through, the officer is able to get the babysitter's name from her. Marissa Tietzort. Yeah. As officers handle getting Marissa Tietzort's address and information, Detective Jennifer Holtz arrives on scene and sits down to interview Heather and Jesse. The following mostly never-before-seen footage has been thoroughly analyzed by a former licensed professional counselor, a licensed professional counselor, and a licensed clinical psychologist. Before the interview can start, Jesse gives Detective Holt some unfortunate news. Sorry, I sent her a text to on Heather's phone and when this was all happening, I shouldn't have done it, I shouldn't have. But, but I said, you killed my sister's baby. What did she say? She didn't say anything there. Sorry, Can I you tell that just, she read it? I was just very Is it like a Facebook message or a text? A text, it doesn't say she Sorry. No, sorry. I just... I was really angry, and it was just like, I was on Heather's phone, and I saw her name, and I just couldn't, I couldn't say so sorry. While this may not seem significant at first, it would turn out to be very important. Although the police can't head to Marissa's apartment to talk just yet, they do send an officer over to her building. Yeah. The interview then gets underway, and at first, everything Heather and Jesse describe sounds normal. Heather was a longtime friend of Marissa's, 
and Marissa had been babysitting her kids whenever Heather had to work. However, as Heather and Jesse describe their interactions with Marissa while picking up the kids that night, it becomes clear that something was very, very wrong. You guys both went inside. No, she didn't even let us inside. Yeah, she met she us did. at the door. And then Marissa handed me the other baby. Yep, and just and said, a diaper bye. Baby. And then Heather was in the doorway for two seconds and said something about the hickey. And, and then the door shut and we were gone. And so it was just real quick. Like, yeah, yeah. she was like, she was at face, the door already. Her with face, the kid. this girl's face was beat. So she I'm has not kidding you. What I thought in my head was, Jesus Christ, what the hell is she on? And usually she's like, okay, what time tomorrow? Or, you know, see you no, tomorrow. It was nothing. Like, nothing, nothing. nothing. This is super unusual. She, 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 she usually I go in the house and I help her. At least pack the kids in their car, the kids, oh, yeah. baby in his car seat, and what, what was, what was Adam doing? Just sitting on the couch, sitting on the couch with the baby. Was he like acting weird, shaking? I didn't even barely look at him. It was dark in there. All that was on was the TV. Like, she just seemed so weird to me. Yeah, but she is never really there. But it was. But it was very. I know Marissa. And this is. And it was just weird. something was really off. There's no denying that Marissa was acting suspiciously and it was quickly becoming evident to Detective Holtz that if she wanted to find out the truth about Benson's death, she was going to have to find Marissa. Unfortunately, this would prove harder than anyone was expecting. Detective Holtz made her way to the apartment Marissa shared with Adam, her longtime boyfriend and the father of her children. With Jesse having texted Marissa about Benson's death, Detective Holtz wasn't sure what to expect when she got to the apartment. Just to be safe, she brought several officers along for backup, as well as Captain Graham. Marissa, we're not going away. Open the door. It soon became evident that no one was going to answer the door, leading officers to take drastic measures. Police department, arrest warrant. What's up, police? Anybody in here? Kids' room. Show me your hands, anybody? Just as they had feared, Marissa was nowhere to be seen. But this didn't mean all hope was lost. Detective Holtz was able to get in touch with Marissa's service provider and have her phone tracked down to a local hotel known as the Plaza. Within an hour, Holtz and Graham were standing in front of Marissa's hotel door. Morning, Adam. Good Is Marissa here? What are you guys doing here? The police Adam just cooperated with us, okay? We'll explain everything in a second. Well, you already charged her. What the f***? Adam, stay here. No. You guys are harassing the hell out of us. If she already got charged, we'll be at court. Why do you gotta come here? Well, because we need to talk to her about something new. Something new? Yep. Marissa, I need you to wake up. <laughs> Why are you guys here? Because we wanted to get away. We got it. From what? Everything. Isn't it against the law to come stay at a hotel room for the night? Can you get up so I can talk to you? Now that the police finally have Marissa and Adam located, it's time to separate them for interviews and see if they have any information about what may have happened to Benson. This is a very important conversation we're about to have, okay? Tell me about taking care of him today. Oh, I was just watching him, and he was fine. Notice Marissa's upward inflection at the end of her sentence when she says he was fine. He was fine. This is not typical of a statement, but rather a question, which indicates that Marissa isn't feeling sure about what she's saying. That was about it. Did you feed him, or? Um, I fed him once, and then he slept, and... Well, we went outside when they first got there a little bit, so. It was you nice and out. the kids? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was he dressed in what? He was dressed in a snowsuit okay. and a blanket. Okay. And then you were home alone, and then what time did Adam get home? Um, he got home at like almost, um, I don't know, maybe 6.30 or something like that. Where was he at? He was hunting. Okay. And then what would you guys do after that, after Adam got home? Um, we, were, we went to eat a little bit um, after he got home. And where'd you go? McDonald's. Which one? The one over um, by the courthouse. Okay. 
go inside through the drive through We went inside. Okay. How long did you stay there? Um, I don't know, about maybe 15 minutes tops. Okay. So did you eat inside or did you mm-hmm. just grab the food and then go? I ate inside. Okay. You were able to finish your meal in 15 minutes? That's mm-hmm. pretty good. Okay. Um, he ate when he got there, and that was about it. Just one bottle, like a full mm-hmm. one, half one? He ate, like, four ounces. Okay. But, yeah, he, like, eats every, it depends. Did Heather send that with you pre-made, or did you make that up? The bottle? Um, she sent it pre-made, okay. and then, yeah, and then I made another one, so. Okay. And then, what happened? And did you come straight home after McDonald's? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. The only place you went outside of the house was McDonald's? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then came straight home and mm-hmm. anything significant happened? No. We came home after McDonald's. Um, uh, we put a movie in, then, like, I don't know how long it was after, but she called and she's like, um, I'm putting my clothes in the dryer and then I'll be there. And then, like, 15 minutes she came there, so. Okay. And did you have him ready, or did she get him ready? Yeah, I, I, I had him ready. I left him in his car seat. So. Okay. How long had he been in his car seat? After McDonald's, it was only like half hour, 45 minutes maybe. Okay. It was right after McDonald's. I just left him in his car seat, and then... You didn't take him back out? No, because usually she's there, there at like 9, 9.30s. Throughout this initial statement, Marissa is repeatedly saying, and then... And then he slept, and and then, like, and then... This usually indicates something being left out in someone's story. In an interview, detectives will dive more deeply into portions of the story where a suspect is repeatedly using phrases like, and then, or, and this happened. Is he awake the whole time? No, uh, he, he was sleeping. When? The whole time. The whole time you babysat him? Well, no, I mean, like, after he got there, he was up for, like, a couple hours, and then... I fed him, and then um, I put him in the pack and play, and then I have this little camera, like the video monitor, and then, like, I didn't check on him, so I have that now, so, like. And he was in your back bedroom, or? Mm-hmm. In our bedroom. In your bedroom. Mm-hmm. In a pack and play. Mm-hmm. And then, um. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm just, like, half asleep. Marissa's laugh and smile here is odd, given the circumstances. This is clearly a serious situation. When a suspect acts unconcerned, this can be a red flag for deception. They may be trying to play it cool so that they don't look guilty, when actually their behavior just makes them look more suspicious. Okay. So the reason we're here, Brittany, I'm sure you must be asking yourself this, right? Not Brittany. I'm sorry, (laughs) Marissa. You have a sister, Brittany, right? Um, The reason we're here is Although the audio here is redacted, we can infer that she informs Marissa that Benson is deceased. Why is he dead? We were hoping that you could shed some light on that. I don't know why. And I need Ow. and I need you to tell me what happened. I don't know what happened. This is the most important conversation you will ever I'm have in your life. You. I'm telling you. I don't. No, you're not telling me. You didn't tell me last time, and you're not telling me now. And I need you to tell me the truth. I, Heather deserves to know what happened. I know. As Detective Holt states, this isn't the first time that Marissa is being questioned about potential child. In fact, it's actually the third time. Two months prior to Benson's death, Detective Holtz was called to the home Marissa shared with her boyfriend Adam after a child sustained severe head and face injuries while in Marissa's care. While Marissa and Adam claimed the child just had an accident, Detective Holtz is determined to figure out the whole story. Mommy, oh, okay. nothing to hide. And Adam, when you say that the child fell off the couch, did you witness that or? No, but, I mean, Marissa's one of these people that, I mean, she resorted to drugs because her kid got taken away to the point where she was a rack of bones, and the only way we got her to go to the clinic and get clean, and she's been clean for four years now, is that we told her we were going to sign her into rehab, and and she doesn't want to get forcefully 
put it in there. Sure. So, That's fair enough. But she has no reason to lie to me. And I mean, whenever she babysits kids and we have other people that she watches for, this coffee table gets put in the living room and then the kids get put toys on. Okay. The toys all come out on the floor. As you see, they're here. Okay. I see this is like a matching set. Are they the same? No, they're not a set. Okay. It's, they just happen to be the same color. Okay, <laughs> I mean, got it. This one I got for free up in Merrill, and that one we've had for a long time. Do you know which couch in particular? It would have been this one. On that side of the couch, sleeping. It was over here sleeping, and she just went to the bathroom. And she came, she was literally just pulling her pants up, and she heard her cry. But, I mean, bitches like they are and can't come talk to me about something or come talk to us before they go and get you guys involved. Um, I mean, she obviously fell and hit a toy or something, and Mercer's not going to go and beat a kid. I mean, she was a child and stuff, so she's very protective of kids. I mean, I, this, is, this is all ridiculous. So, <laughs> I'm getting a little upset about no, it. No, I know, and just calm down. We're, you know, everything's I can't fine. calm down because, like I said, I got f***ed over by social services too many times. I try to work with them, and I'll look. He's our fifth child. I got pictures of my kids here, and that's all I can do. That's all I get to see of them is pictures. So, and there's nothing I can do about them. Although Adam isn't getting into specifics here, he's referencing the fact that four of his and Marissa's children were all taken by social services. Had social services known about their fifth and youngest child, he also would have likely been taken. Detective Holtz and the women from child services wait around in the apartment for a while until finally... Marissa arrives home. Oh, hi. Hi. Marissa? Yeah. Put on the dog smoke in the house so they're in the bathrooms. Huh? Hello? Hello. So I'm Jennifer. I'm a detective with the Westa Police Department, and I've been assigned to investigate, follow up on um, who I understand you were providing care for, mm -hmm. um, and these fine young ladies are from social services. Yeah. So, because there's a child involved and you were providing care for that child at the time social services gets involved. So, I just need to hear from you. I was babysitting. Um, she went to bed, so I decided to clean. And then I was, like, uh, doing dishes. Heard her uh, screaming. And then stopped doing dishes and then stopped the couch and there's a bunch of toys. Because usually I have her sister, so when she, like, follows her. So I had a bunch of toys out in the living room. Okay. So you were doing dishes and you heard screaming. Mm -hmm. Was she sleeping or? Yeah, she was laying sleeping. there. Yep. And she must have rolled off. And then I stopped doing the dishes and she was on the floor. And all she had was rug burn. Mm -hmm. And then she had bruises, so she must have hit a toy. What toy was on the floor? I had all, like, I had a bunch of, like, this table was out. <laughs> and I had a bunch of toys, like, in the middle on the rug. Okay. You know, which place were A bunch. Like, I took a bunch out of the... Oh, okay. she was And she was sleeping on this couch. She must have rolled. And she come but I take the table out when I babysit and put it in the kitchen. It's an immediate red flag for deception that Marissa fails to incorporate any of her own emotions during her account of what happened. Most people who are telling the truth will include their feelings during the event. However, it's typically difficult for a guilty person to fake emotion, so guilty individuals will often opt to keep their emotions very neutral, even if it's completely inappropriate to stay neutral given the circumstances. Has anything like this come up with you before? No. As far as no, a child being injured? No. no. Are you sure about that? Were you talked to about a year ago for a child that was injured that sustained a skull fracture? Oh, yeah, that was... The that was not me. Huh? You were providing care for her? Well, yeah, I was, but... I don't okay. have any child abuse or nothing. Okay. <laughs> Where I have is... kids, so, like, I've never... I love kids. I don't <laughs> feed them nothing. Okay. I always babysit people's kids, like... <laughs> Right. And nobody's saying you beat anybody, but no, people okay. lose their temper sometimes. No, I'm never, Things like that happen. I never had postpartum, nothing. Oh. Noticeably, Marissa also doesn't flat out deny these prior allegations. I love kids. I don't <laughs> beat them, nothing. In theory, it should be a flat out denial, but she just can't seem to get the words right. Something that will surely stand out to detectives. Talking about how much she loves kids is still not a straight denial of her allegations. 
It can be difficult for a guilty individual to make a false denial, as their body will automatically start showing physiological signs of anxiety. With an ongoing child abuse investigation against Marissa, Social Services informs the couple that their baby son won't be able to stay with them. Adam doesn't take the news very well. We place with relatives. If you don't have a relative, then we have to look at foster care. So I need you to give me some relatives. We place with friends at this point. So do you have a brother or a sister or an aunt, uncle, or Adam does. Does Adam? Okay. Adam, so it's an older not investigation. There has to go to your dad. No. So hey, can we go? Go! Adam, stop! Adam, stop! Stop! They said with family. No. Until investigation is over. I want your dad. dad. Your dad. My dad cannot watch it. You guys can go, or I can leave and he can watch him. You guys need to leave. Go. Can I just live with her for until the investigation? You need to leave. We can't leave. We can't leave now. Yeah, he wasn't here. He can take him. No, you can't leave. Watch the child. are having very different reactions to their son being removed from their home. Although Adam's feelings are valid and many people in this situation would feel angry, his outburst is clearly upsetting the baby, and he doesn't seem to recognize that. Marissa, on the other hand, is notably calm about their entire situation. This is rather unusual, as most parents would be quite upset about having their child taken, especially if they didn't do anything wrong. This may be an act on her part. She may think that she needs to appear relaxed, because if she is explosive like Adam, it will just look like she acted that way with the child she babysat. And there's nothing anymore. You guys can go bring the dog in here, do whatever the fuck you want to do. But my kid's staying here. With these memories fresh in her mind, Detective Holtz is unrelenting in her interview with Marissa. Heather deserves 
to know what happened. I know. <laughs> no, you're not sure. No, you're not. I am. I don't know what happened. I promise. I understand that things get oh frustrating. My God. Especially with you being pregnant and having a yeah, child no, of your own. They were frustrating. I promise you that. Marissa is likely trying to bolster her statements by stating, I promise you that. When someone is being deceptive, they will try really hard to sell you on their story. Whereas someone who's being honest doesn't need to go to such lengths. Marissa may not have been comfortable enough with her answer about how the kids weren't frustrating. Likely because it was a lie and she did find them to be frustrating. So she needed to prop her claim up with a promise to make it sound more convincing. This theory is backed up by Adam's statements to Officer Cole back in the hotel room. So you get home, what time? 7? 6.37, somewhere in that area? And what's going on in the apartment when you get home? The kids are all sleeping. The topic then shifts to Jathan, who Marissa also babysat. He doesn't play with much. He's a pretty quiet kid. I shouldn't say quiet. If you look at him wrong, he starts crying. I mean, lately, he's been, he's been getting used to us. Then take me through the rest of the next few hours until you guys decide to come over here. We went to McDonald's, came home, and... Who went to McDonald's? All of you? All of us, yeah. The three kids in the back seat. And Which McDonald's? The one by the courthouse. Okay. Then came home. Who picked him up out of the back and play and put him into the car? Or I packed him up and put him in there. Okay. He, absolutely normal to me. And what is normal? Whiny. <laughs> as soon as you pick him up, he whines and stuff. And so he was making noise? And yeah, making noise. and Open his eyes at all? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, crying and everything else. Adam describing Heather's kids in such negative terms is concerning. Referring to a two-month-old baby as whiny is especially unusual because it's normal for a baby that young to cry frequently. It's also possible that being overly critical of the children is a misguided attempt to protect Marissa. Back in the hallway, Marissa attempts to explain why she and Adam fled to the hotel. I got a little money from a car accident, and we, I wanted to go swimming and stuff, but by the time she picked the kids up, and I wanted to go in a hot tub, but I don't think I came when I was pregnant. I was pregnant, so... What's the real reason you're here? No, that is the real reason. I'm serious. Nobody who lives in this town checks into a hotel at 9.50 p.m. after a baby died in their apartment. I don't know. I didn't know that he died. And that's also a lie because she texted you and told you that he died. My phone's off. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's see? not. I'll show you my phone. I'm serious. How do you think we found you? It's obvious that Marissa's story isn't adding up. But the question is, what exactly could she be hiding? Marissa is likely keenly aware that with her previous child investigation, she looks incredibly suspicious right now. Even if Benson's death was just a heartbreaking accident, her history with kids makes it hard to trust her. Could she and Adam have fled to the hotel because of this? I'm serious. Now cut the crap, Marissa. This is the third time we've had a discussion with you about a child, an infant you. in your care, and now one I is dead. One is dead. I didn't do nothing to him. Then who did? No one. He was fine. Did Adam do something to him? No, no one did anything to him. He was fine. Babies don't just die. Marissa keeps sniffing and scrunching up her face as if she's crying. However, it doesn't appear that there are any tears falling. She's likely trying to give off the appearance that she's upset, but she's not a good actress, and it comes off very disingenuous. He was fine. Babies don't just die. I would not kill a baby. I'm sure you didn't mean to, Marissa. Sometimes I didn't. it's not what you do, Marissa. It's sometimes what you, you don't do. And maybe there was something you just didn't do tonight. I'm alone for too long. Yeah. Not excited 
didn't kill. Was it an accident? I didn't steal. Did you leave him alone? I left him in the pack and play after we got off, uh, after we got back in from outside. Was he okay? He didn't make any noise. I have that video monitor thing. I didn't kill him. I promise you guys that. He was never kill a baby. <laughs> So what happened when you came back from outside? Check that. He just uses the video baby monitor. And when and you went back inside and checked on him. Huh? When you went back inside and he was in the back of what? Mm -hmm. What you saw was her. I use the baby monitor and when he like makes a noise it will you can hear it. And I didn't hear anything, so yeah. I didn't kill him. Right. At, at what point did you realize that he was dead? I don't know. Did he die in the back? Marissa's shrugging in response to Captain Graham's questions are huge red flags that she was involved. Someone who was innocent would readily be able to provide clear answers for the questions. I didn't kill him. Like I said, there is things that you commit, things that you do, and sometimes as a result of things that we don't do, bad things happen, and we know that bad things happen. When did you know Marissa? I know. We know. Accidents happen. I just didn't, I thought that baby monitor thing would be fine. So I didn't check on him. How long? It's okay. Oh, we can talk through this. I'll get you some tissue. What? Oh my god. Oh my god. Sometimes things happen. But we need to know the truth and it's all okay. I just did check on him. I have a baby monitor, but I didn't kill him. The detectives know that most suspects are more comfortable admitting to an accident rather than intentional harm, and Marissa is no exception. She's latched onto the scenario, likely because she thinks she won't get in as much trouble. While there's every chance that this may be the real truth, there are still some parts of Marissa's story that aren't making sense. And as Holtz and Graham are about to discover, Marissa knows a lot more than she's letting on. So how long was it that you didn't check on him? So start, start over. Uh, it was like um, after when, um, like before Adam got there, he checked on him. Did you know that? But I didn't kill him. I know. Oh my God. How did, how did you know? Uh, you know? Just because it's been that, um, well, he does sleep that long, and, like, but I don't know, he, like, felt cold, and I was scared. I'm my sure. boyfriend wasn't I'm there scared. and everything, so, oh, my God. I'm sure, know. I'm sure it's scary. How did you find him? How was he laying? I put him on his belly. Okay. And, he, and how did you, how did you find him? I was, was like just just on his belly. Where was his face? Uh, in the um, uh, like this, face down. Mm -hmm. Did you? I'm just trying to. So, if this is his face mm -hmm. and this is his back, and you put him like this, mm -hmm. and you you didn't find his head turned anyway. It was just straight down. I think it was. Is there anything coming out of his mouth? Or no. Okay. No. And he felt cold then? Mm -hmm. And that was before Adam got home? Mm-hmm. Who picked him up out of the back and play and put him into the car? Or? I picked him up and put him in there. Okay. He, absolutely normal to me. The fact that Marissa can't seem to clearly remember how Benson's head was positioned when she found him is a red flag, as this is something that she should be able to remember. If she walked in and the baby's face was straight down into the bed, 
This is something that would trigger alarm bells and would likely stand out in her memory. But that baby monitor, it was like almost $100. And like when they make any noise, they're like, you can hear it. And that has like the um, camera thing. So it's your thing that didn't work? No, it worked. It worked? Yeah. You left him alone for too mm-hmm. long. Okay. You went to McDonald's? No, I brought him back. Where did, did you put clothes on him? Did you put I a put snowsuit it, on? I put a snowsuit and hat on. And Adam didn't notice that he was dead? He probably just thought he was sleeping. Did you check for a pulse? Did you see if he was breathing? Or did you just feel his skin was cold? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he just wasn't making any noise. What did you think was going to happen when Heather came to pick him up? I don't know. Like, did you think she wasn't going to notice? or? Oh, yeah. That she was or wasn't going to notice. She was going to notice. Did you try to do anything to revive her? Uh-uh. Try to do CPR? No, I don't even know how to do that. It helped me understand uh, the discovery there. Yeah, why, why didn't you call police? Because I was scared and my boyfriend wasn't there. And I didn't want my baby, my baby taken. By this point, Marissa has mentioned several times how she was scared, but she doesn't express any concern for Benson or how his mother is feeling now. Marissa appears to be very egocentric and is only thinking about the baby's death in terms of how it affects her. We do have an arrest warrant for you based on your other child. So we're going to be taking you into custody. Can I smoke a cigarette? Sure. Thank you. We're gonna... How am I going to get out? Although it seems like detectives are getting the truth out of Marissa, there is one major problem. Her story isn't matching up with Adam's. According to Marissa, Benson was dead before Adam ever got home, and Adam was none the wiser. However, Adam is claiming that not only did he pick Benson up and get him loaded into the car, but supposedly Benson was crying and whining during this. One of them is lying and it's up to the police to figure out which one of them it is. Okay, Adam, here's what I need the explanation for. We know why you guys came over here. I, I'm my children's, I'm my life. <laughs> um, we know Marissa's received messages on her phone, letting her know. The audio is redacted here, but the officer informs Adam that Benson is deceased. Come on now. I, I swear to God, I did not know this. Yes. No, I, I swear I didn't. So? I swear I didn't know. Marissa's phone is in here somewhere. I didn't know, I swear. Heather has my phone number. She never, not once. So that's your phone? This is my phone, yes. Where's Marissa's phone? I don't know. I can call it and find it. It's... That's all right. And then you guys come over here. You leave I shortly after can't... Heather leaves. And like, and another reason we came here is Marissa's sister is supposed to be getting her kids tonight for the night. So we figured we'd come get it and she can just take the room tomorrow. Or today. So there's going to be an autopsy tomorrow that's going to tell us a lot more than what we know right now about the cause of death. And if things don't add up, because yeah, right now I'm seeing a lot of red flags about why you guys came over here. No, I... Why I, nobody... There appears to be two options here. He's either telling the truth about part of what happened, meaning he did get Benson out of the pack and play, but he knew the child was dead. Or he's lying about being the one to get Benson out of the pack and play because he thinks this will protect Marissa from getting in trouble. Accidents happen. But there needs to be some sort of explanation that has to come from one of you two. Uh, I, or both, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I mean, we see babies that uh, it's kind of a, a bedding issue that they suffocate accidentally. Um, I've seen children that were given too much medication because they were too fussy, too whiny, and so the caregiver was trying to get them to sleep or, you know, 
Officer Kolb is offering up more acceptable reasons for why Benson may have died. He's being careful not to portray Marissa as being a cold-blooded killer because he knows that could make Adam shut down from the conversation. However, if he can sow a seed of doubt in Adam's mind about how it could have been an unfortunate accident, Adam may be more willing to provide information that could be helpful to the investigation. Can I ask her? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So why is he telling us? Leaving to go to McDonald's if Benson was alive. Because he was probably scared. No, he didn't know. He don't know. He don't what know. would he have to be scared of, Paul Marissa? That I'm going to get in trouble or go to jail? Yeah, he doesn't know. <laughs> Why would he be covering up for you if he doesn't know that you did anything wrong? Remember we talked about being honest? I know. Yeah, man. Okay. <sighs> I'll freak out where she said they're going to escape. So, I got a PhD on this one, too. Okay, I'm going to see you guys tomorrow. But, you know what's going on, right? This is going on. Oh, my God. Bedroom, what did you tell me? She got on when Heather got there? No, when you guys were going to McDonald's. I got a model there, I think. I mean, I and he was making noise, he said, several yeah. times we asked and clarified yeah. that with you, right? Yeah. Is that the truth? Uh, yeah, he was busting and stuff when we left. <sighs> we just don't want this situation complicated by lies. Obviously, we're all just trying to figure out what I, happened. I, I know. <laughs> and Marissa's made some admissions to some things, but there's just some little things that aren't matching up with what you're telling us and what oh, you're telling us. I just don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't remember. I get him out of the bedroom, or did you, or when we went to McDonald's? I don't know. No, oh, I did. Um, she did. I mean, I, I just don't remember. Adam's claim of I don't remember is a selective memory statement, which can sometimes be legitimate or could be a sign of possible deception. It's possible that Adam used deductive reasoning to figure out that Marissa was under suspicion for something related to Benson. He likely didn't know what Marissa was being accused of, but it was clearly related to her care of other children, so he decided in the moment to lie in the hopes that he could protect her from further trouble. However, he might be less willing to protect her from trouble after he learns what she's been hiding from him. Have you? So Adam, what, what she has uh, admitted to out there while we were talking in here is that while you were out hunting, oh, she already knew. Likely suffocated, and that. Did she tell me? Easy, of course. She's probably freaking about that. And even when you came home and went to McDonald's, she's saying she knowingly put and into the car, leading you to believe he's alive and well. And he was dead all that time. And do you understand? We're not we're not here to argue with you, fight with you, or nothing. We want what's best for the kids. I understand. Okay? And I think you do too. I do. Yes. And I even think Marissa does. She does. But she has a, a poor way of doing it, I guess. Smart. I mean, you can ask anybody that you live around. She's I mean, she's just like that. Everybody gets in those in a mood where they don't want to be bothered or whatever. But normally when she when that happens, I mean, she'll tell me and then I'll take him take care of him and she can go take a shower and do what she's gotta do. That's why every time this happens I'm not And that's why I told her I didn't, I didn't want her watching. Hey, kids. As Adam waits at the hotel to deal with CPS, Marissa agrees to go back to her apartment with Detective Holtz in order to demonstrate how she found Benson. If Detective Holtz can clearly see how Benson was positioned, she may be able to determine if his death was the result of an accident, SIDS, or something far oh. more sinister. We have these dolls just because it makes it a little more realistic as far as, like, facial shape and things like okay. that. What I want you to do is just, like, walk through... Exactly how you put him down. Crabby. Okay. Yeah, so then I just put him in here and then I turn the camera on and so I put him in here and then put the blue blanket on. 
So you, when we were at the hotel, you were talking about, like, his face was to the side oh, a little yeah. bit? Yep. Can you show me exactly how his head was? I know his, his body probably isn't gonna, is not going to... Right, this isn't it's completely anatomically correct, but if you could just show, like, how his face was. I, I realized that his body was flat, mm-hmm. um, and it wouldn't turn off like that, but it was to... Was it to that side specifically? Um, so to his I think right? so, yeah. Although Marissa's been laughing and smiling throughout this demonstration, she's likely still feeling some anxiety. If we look at her hands, we can see that they're almost closed into fists, which indicates that she's feeling tense. Most caregivers would be traumatized by having a baby die in their care. Having to reenact their last actions with the infant would likely be difficult and emotional. In stark contrast to this, Marissa appears to be completely unaffected. However, this image of her clenched hands may provide a glimpse into her inner stress. Did he have a nook? No nook. Okay. Just the receiving blanket and then his blanket. So the receiving blanket was already folded up and laid down before you came mm-hmm. in here? When did you, when would you have done that? Um, I think I did it, I laid him on the couch. And when you found him, exact same position or was he different? Um, I think he is in the same position. Okay. I need you to really try hard to remember because this is important. I know. Um, could he have been in a different position? But still, in, was he still in the middle? Had he yeah, no, over? he was in the middle. I think he was in the same position. Based on her frequent responses of, I think so. I think I, um, I think. It seems like Marissa is making things up as she goes. Okay, so walk me through how you determine that he's not alive. Because I picked him up and he was really cold. How did you pick him up? Um, I just went like this. <laughs> okay. And what did he what did he look like? He was just cold. Marissa is completely unemotional. Once again, she fails to mention any of her thoughts and feelings when she discovered Benson was dead, which could be a sign that Marissa is being deceitful and hiding something from the detective. The question is, what exactly is she hiding? And then what did you do? Um, laid him down, put a snowsuit on. Where did you lay him down? Oh, I think I laid him on the floor. So I put his car seat in there, and I grabbed his snowsuit, laid him on the floor, put him in the snowsuit, and then put him in his car seat with his blankets. Okay. And then where did you put the car seat? Um, I think I left it in there. With the door open or shut? With the door open. I left him in there, put the door open, and then, um, Adam got here, and then we left. Leave him in the car seat, Mm -hmm. in his snowsuit, Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Um, And you you laid him on the floor, but you don't know CPR, Mm -mm. no attempts to call anyone or research anything online to see if really. Do you see if there's anything maybe stuck in his mouth or... Okay. And you said no nook. No nook. Okay. As Detective Holtz is listing off logical responses to finding Benson dead, Marissa simply nods with indifference, perhaps implying that there was another reason that she didn't try to investigate Benson's unresponsiveness. Do you always leave the baby monitor on, or how do you guys? Um, just when I have him back there. We just got it on Tuesday. So. Okay, so how did you? So you had it back there. You had the baby monitor on, or no? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then what did you Was do? it facing there? Where were you sitting? Yeah, I was facing right there, and I was right here. Okay, so then when when did you turn it off? Um, After they left, and we left. Okay, how did you turn it off? What do you mean, like, I just turned it off? Turn it on and turn it off. So it, it surprised you to know that your baby monitor is unplugged? Is it? Yeah. I might have unplugged it, too, because you have to charge these, but I did have it on and everything. Why would you unplug the camera? What? The camera. Because, oh, I stopped using it. When I stopped using it, I just turned, unplug it. I did have it on and everything. Are you sure? I'm sure. When you're done using it, you just turn it off. I promised on everything. I had it on. Marissa making promises or likely attempts to bolster her lies. Having gathered all of the relevant information at the apartment, Marissa is officially arrested and spends the rest of the night in jail. Although it seemed Marissa was telling detectives everything she knew about Benson's death, his autopsy came back with shocking results. 
prompting Captain Graham and Detective Holtz to bring Marissa in for one more interview. This room setup is not ideal for an interrogation, as there's a huge table between Marissa and the detectives. It would be better if there was no table at all, so that the detectives could observe Marissa's entire nonverbal communication instead of having half of her body being hidden from view. I can say without a doubt that what you're telling me is not true. He's got very severe injuries to his head. Yeah, I don't know how. I'd like to give you an opportunity yeah, to explain yourself. I promise you I did not do nothing to him. Promise. That's I, why I asked you I know. No, he did not fall. Did he, did he roll and tumble just a little bit first? Not that I've seen. I did not do anything to him. Marissa uses a qualification phrase when she says, not that I've seen, which gives her an escape in the future, allowing her to blame her faulty memory or say that she didn't see what had actually happened. Based upon what the doctors saw, based upon what Jen saw, is that the child did not die as a result of having a brief. And I'm hoping that, you know, based upon your relationship with Heather and based upon the genuine love that I know that you have for children, um, it's important that Heather knows what... what no, I didn't do anything to him. Because something happened in that apartment and you were the only adult. I know. Based upon what you're telling me, it couldn't have been Adam. It couldn't have been. Yeah. Or could it? No. But Adam came back at some point, and, and you've seen, and we've seen Adam get upset, really at the snap of a finger. And are, are you sure that he didn't do something to him? I'm sure. The thing is, Mark says that science doesn't lie. I know. There's absolutely no doubt. You like to think that you're not some cold-blooded person. I'm not. And I, I want to believe that you do genuinely love children. I see it. I see it with you and her, and I see it with the baby that you're carrying. And I'm sure you had a bond with them because you've been mm-hmm. watching. Yeah, I have. I did not kill him. I would never, I can't, never, can never kill anyone in my life. As Marissa gets emotional for the first time in the interrogation, she uses the word kill. It seems that what may have triggered her tearfulness is when the detective started talking about how Marissa loves kids and may have had a bond with Benson. Earlier in the interrogation, Marissa seemed to be avoiding the word kill, instead saying that she didn't do anything. Sometimes these nonspecific statements are used by deceptive individuals because it allows them to dance around having to be more specific. An innocent person is more likely to be straightforward and use necessary language because they want to ensure it's clear what they're denying. A deceptive person may prefer to avoid using such explicit language because it means they will have to look the detectives in the eye and lie. Well, something happened, and it may have been an accident. It may have been a fall. But something happened, and it was not that he went to sleep when I saw It was not. So let's get over that. Wait, maybe I did not do anything to him. Then what happened? I don't know. Something terrible happened. And you were taking care of him. And it's important for Heather. It's important for you. And it's going to look better for you, quite frankly, if you... Mm. And this is your one opportunity. I am. If I could never do anything like that to any kid, that's why I don't want to think that it was intentional. I think it was an accident. Well, so you have maybe more than I can imagine. A lot going on. You know, you have you know, this other case that was out there, which you know is a felony offense. Yeah. Is 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 pretty serious and. And you have other children that have been 
taken away. And, you know, you're on the road to recovering from some drug addiction. And sometimes the weights of life can become too much to bear and you see yourself acting without even thinking, without even thinking, just reacting in ways that are outside of your character. And I, I wonder if something like that happened on Thursday. Yeah. You know, extra fussy because he's got some sores and just not receiving the feeding well and nothing like that. No, I would never, I can never, I mean, I love kids way too much, I can never, no. I hear you say that, and I, I want to believe you, like I said, but there has to be an explanation and it's not what you told us. Suspects may be more willing to confess if they feel like the detective truly understands them and their situation. Graham and Holtz are both doing a really good job of relating to Marissa and being empathetic. In the Reed technique, it's important for investigators to appear non-judgmental, as that creates a dynamic in which the suspect may be more likely to open up. I don't know what happened. Like I said, he fell. Not that not when I was around, he didn't fall. We were the only one there, right? I know. Yes. Hurt badly. I want to believe that it was an accident, and you're not a monster. You're not a monster. Please explain. Well, then it must have been an accident. Like I said, I just fed him, burped him, changed him, put him in the thing, in the thing. And what did he hit his head? He didn't hit his head. He hit his head. I don't know how he would have hit his head. Who could have hit, hit him in the head? I don't know. Could he have fallen? I'm asking you. No, I was around. I mean, he didn't just fall without anybody around and nobody noticing and then put himself back in the passing place. I don't you have this one opportunity to explain it all. By increasing her proximity to Marissa, Detective Holtz is increasing the pressure for her to confess. I don't know, baby. On the couch, here's the place. Like, is sort of like the hard part of the couch? Like the arm? The arm. <laughs> or in like the arm part. I don't know. So as you were sitting him down, was it even too hard? As maybe. You knocked his head a little bit? I don't know, because I could never... Show me how you I don't know, I just put him on the couch. Well, a child will figure out how to do this. Yeah. Okay, so. I need you to, if you're going to tell me your truth, I need it to be 100% sincere. Right. I'm going to let you talk. Tell me what happened. Oh, maybe the couch arm, or maybe the plaything, I don't know. What would you put on? Just like that. Hmm. I just throw my own, no, I can never do that. It's an interesting statement. Did you fall? No, I could never. Neither Holtz nor Graham have suggested that Benson could have been thrown, so it's highly suspicious that Marissa suddenly introduces this new idea. When new language is introduced by the suspect, such as what Marissa has just done here, detectives will likely see it as a big red flag that the suspect has been hiding something. Marissa is still refusing to tell Detective Holtz the truth, so Holtz decides to play into Marissa's emotions and ask her how she would feel if it was her own child who died. Think of how terrible that would be. I know. And not knowing what his last second was like. Please help me. Please bring that to Heather. You're not. Please. As a mother, she deserves to know what happened to And this is your last chance to tell me the truth. Otherwise, I am left to walk out here and tell Heather. But apparently Marissa is a monster. Because no. She can't even explain what she did. 
Even if it was an accident, please, you have to help me tell Heather. After this desperate emotional appeal from Detective Holtz, Marissa sits in complete silence for nearly two minutes before finally opening up a bit. During this long pause, Marissa is likely trying to decide what she's going to say. Should she stick with her story about how she doesn't know? Should she confess the truth? Or should she admit to something in between? She may be weighing the pros and cons of each option in her head. Most people care what others think of them, at least to some extent. So hearing the detective say that you will be thought of as a monster may help motivate Marissa to tell the truth. I don't know. Maybe I put him down too hard. But I didn't kill him or anything. You didn't mean to. I don't think you meant to. No. Could never. Where did you put him down too hard and how? Show me. I don't know. Like, maybe like that? Where? <laughs> Give me the playpen. Watch the playpen. Your guys is the one you guys have. There's the only I could think of. How many times? One? Twice? Two times? Once? <laughs> it's the only thing I could think of. I could never. That's not true. I could never. So I don't know, I promise. I'm you telling saying you. I could never, but you know what you did. You did. I did not. That child had multiple injuries to his head. Not one time, and it's not from a playpen. I don't know where he could have got it from. I did not do it. On everything. I'm smelling you the truth. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. I'm Absolutely the truth. not. Unless it was harder than that. Could it have been harder than that? And could it have happened more than one time? Yeah, no. Just you said once. it's more than one time. Just once. But was it harder than that? I don't know. I didn't think so. And when you did that, did you stop breathing? I don't remember. You don't remember? That's pretty significant. I, 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 I don't remember if the child died right in front of me. When a suspect claims to have a memory failure, such as claiming not to remember such a major detail, this can be a sign of deception. Marissa saying that she can't recall if Benson died right after she put him down roughly is a major red flag, as most people would remember such a significant event. How were you holding on to him? What do you mean? Were you holding on to him? Yeah. Like this? Person here who is 
sorry for what she did. I am. I'm frustrated. I'm sorry. And in that frustration, the one is it your bedroom? Mm hmm And the pack and play is right there next to the bed. Mm hmm And were you standing right next to the pack and play? Were you standing by the door and just threw no, him in there? No, standing next to the pack and play. Like, were your eyes touching the pack and play like this, or was the pack and play like that far away? And you just... Oh, no, not like that. So, yeah. can you show me? That's like this. Then just throw them in. Just throw them in. Mm -hmm. Was it with all your force, all your strength, you just threw them in there? I don't know, I think so. You think so? So you, with all your force, mm -hmm. just like that, as hard as you could. Not really as hard, but... <laughs> but hard enough. Marissa is still vague in her description. But Graham getting up is important here because it makes Marissa have to demonstrate what she did. Graham clearly dramatized the throw from a very far distance, which forced Marissa to have to clarify that she didn't throw Benson from such a far off distance. But she did, in fact, throw him. Did you cry? Is that what you're saying? Or did you stop crying? He just cried for a couple minutes. And then what else happened? Then that was it. <laughs> Some multiple injuries. Yeah, I promise you, I do not know where he got the under injuries. <laughs> promise. Did you grab him by a hand, by a foot? No. Oh. That's why I asked you, Marissa, how, how were you holding him when you threw him into the pack and play because he has some other injuries? Right. I said he has some broken bones. He does. I don't think he wants to do it that hard. Did did he tumble a little bit when he was when you threw him in the pack and play? Like did he roll? Because I, I could see if if you're walking down the hall when you come in the room, you're a little upset and frustrated, you throw him like that. I could see that he might tumble a little bit in the pack and play and maybe get lodged up against something. I, what I wasn't there, Marissa, so help, yeah. me, help me understand yeah. in my mind what, what happened. When you threw I know. Him. What happened? So I was just frustrated and threw him in the pack and play. And what did you see happen when he landed in the pack and play? Like what happened to his body? Mm -hmm. Did he just oh, stay in one, one position or did he roll or? I think he hit the side, but that's about it. What part of him hit the side? Head. And was it the, the corner where it's hard, or was it? Yeah, it was the corner. Which corner? I don't know. One of the corners. So was he kind of then just curled up in the corner? I don't think so. I think it maybe his head was down. So you, you throw him in, he tumbles into the corner of the packet play. Mm -hmm. Is he face down at that point, or is he face up, or is he to the side? He's face down. Okay, so you throw him down on his back, he tumbles a little bit into the corner of the packet play, and his face is down. Mm -hmm. Then do you pick him up again and throw him down? Or what do you do? No. What, what do you do? I just pick them up and put them in the middle. Even while she confesses to throwing him into the pack and play and then rearranging his body, Marissa doesn't appear to have any remorse for what she did to Benson. You throw him in there. He tumbles into the corner. Mm -hmm. You had said that he cried for a couple minutes. Yeah. Now you're saying, that. now, well, did no. you just did no. you stand there for a couple minutes? Sam? And this Well, maybe not a couple minutes. Maybe a minute or less. Did oh. you stay in the room with him or go out before you put on back on his stomach? And I stayed in the room and just looked at him while he was crying. Yeah. Maybe you were in shock. Like, what did I just do? I, yeah. This couple I minutes. Was, this couple minutes thing is is confusing. Oh, I was in shock of what just happened to him, what I did to him. 
I was frustrated. So you were frustrated, and what shocked you was the fact that you threw mm -hmm. him into the pack of play mm -hmm. very hard. Mm -hmm. Maybe not with all of your strength, mm -hmm. but you were really frustrated. Mm -hmm. And he tumbles into the corner, maybe hits his head on the corner, and then you stand there and he cries for a little bit? No, I just cried for a couple seconds. A couple seconds. And then in the middle. And then you take him from the corner, mm -hmm. he's no longer crying, right. and you just set him face mm -hmm. down in the center. Mm -hmm. Why'd you move him if he wasn't crying? I'm scared. Should be done at that point? Yeah. Oh, you're not. Well, you wasn't doing anything? Yeah, I was. Did you try to do something to bring him back to life? Try to put in his mouth, because that's all I know what to do. Okay, I'm not saying you are, yeah. Okay. Because I could see you trying to undo what, what has just happened, right? Yeah, I tried. And that tells me a little bit about who you are, Marissa. That, yeah, I made a mistake here, but I don't want this child to die. Right. If I would have done it, if I would have known how to do CPR, I would have done it, but I just blew in his mouth. I don't know how to do CPR. Although Marissa now claims to have tried to revive Benson, she laughed and denied trying to revive him at all. I don't know how to do that. No attempts to call anyone or research anything online to see if really, you see if there's anything maybe stuck in his mouth or... This discrepancy in her story indicates that she might be pretending to have tried to save Benson's life in order to not look like a monster, since at this point, she's confessed and likely knows that she's in for some major consequences. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm frustrated. Yeah. Very yeah. understand. <gasps> and rings. And trying to make it right. I <laughs> <laughs> Although Marissa is sobbing, this may be in response to the consequences of her actions, which she knows are coming, not for what she did. Because Adam wasn't there, and I had the other kids. Yeah, so I was scared. <laughs> the reason she didn't call 911 is likely selfish. She was afraid of being apprehended. She may have thought that the best option was to cover up the crime, even going so far as to keep the secret from her boyfriend. You're going to get a high pitch fine. That's the problem. I know. <laughs> I'm not making a high You know, I have court for this. They went right in November 1st. I know. I'm sorry. I was scared and frustrated. But you get frustrated too with all my things. Yeah, she even said that. Yep. Every parent, kids are. every parent gets frustrated. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. And then eventually, down the line, you're going to face charges from this incident. The one, the lunch. I don't know. That came to yeah. happen. We need to talk through this with the district attorney's office and just kind of walk through this with Oakley and retract from the future. I mean, you have to know that, that there's consequences for what yeah, I, know, I understand your story, and that does mean a lot. But no, we, we need to make sure this never happens. Mm -hmm. oh, Do you have any other questions for us? Mm -hmm. Once again, Marissa shows that she's putting herself first by asking for a lower bond. She also appears to be surprised to find out that she will be charged. It's almost as if she expected that if she just said sorry, they would let her go. Marissa is failing to see the seriousness of the crime and even attempts to deflect responsibility from herself to Heather. While sitting in jail awaiting trial, 
Marissa began to form relationships with a variety of pen pals, promising that she would love them, be physically intimate with them, and move in with them after prison in exchange for these pen pals giving her money. In a report written by Detective Holtz, it was noted that Marissa was especially good at manipulating people and was able to juggle all of these relationships while also manipulating Adam into believing that she wasn't cheating on him so he would also give her money. Marissa also occupied her time in jail by begging the judge to give her a lighter bail. A letter to the judge written by Marissa reads, This Marisa Tietzort and I want a bond reduction because this is crazy that don't get half signature bond and lowered like really I'm not a monster or whatever. I love kids and I'm a mom to five kids plus I'm pregnant now with my sixth kid. That's right, not only does she not grasp the severity of her crime against Benson, but she tries to claim that she's a loving and successful mother to her children, even though most of those children were removed from her care. According to Detective Holtz, Marissa believed she would be getting a light sentence for Benson's murder, as she and her attorney were planning on claiming that she wasn't guilty due to brain damage caused by her extended substance abuse. Things didn't go the way Marissa had hoped, however, and she was instead sentenced to 37 years for Benson's death and another three years for the injuries caused to the child who had supposedly fallen off her couch just two months prior to Benson's death. 